I want to wish a happy hello to everybody here at the forum. This is our annual poetry read, and I'm hoping you've all brought some wonderful poems in for everyone for everyone to enjoy. Uh, I thought I'd give this little introduction, if there's time. Uh, this is a talk by Greg Brounderville that I'm presenting. It's a part of a TED series talks. Um, Greg is a professor at Southern Methodist University. However, he spent a few years in uh, Jefferson City where he taught a poetry workshop that I was uh, lucky enough to attend. Uh, I learned a great deal from Greg and uh, was totally inspired by his teaching and his knowledge and his wisdom, his compassion. I mean, he was an amazing, an amazing poet, an amazing man. Uh, I hope you enjoy this talk, uh, this TED talk, and uh, I think you'll find it uh, really interesting. Wallace Stevens wrote a poem called Disillusionment of 10 O'Clock. It goes like this. The houses are haunted by white nightgowns. None are green or purple with green rings or green with yellow rings or yellow with blue rings. None of them are strange with socks of lace or beaded centures. People are not going to dream of baboons and periwinkles. Only here and there an old sailor, drunk and asleep in his boots, catches tigers in red weather. Don't you love this idea of this old sailor, drunk and asleep in his boots with this wild, beautiful imagination, catching tigers in red weather? I like to think that Wallace Stevens had the old sailor inside him, but you might not have known it from appearances. Wallace Stevens was, after all, in addition to being a poet, a highly successful insurance exec with Hartford Indemnity. And I can just imagine him walking around in nice neighborhoods in his adopted hometown there in Connecticut, bemoaning the stultifying sameness of respectable life. In my vision, he yearns for strange beauty and finds it, maybe via that old sailor inside him, in poetry. Now myself, I've never had to fret too much about being deadened by the poshness of suburbia as I grew up in the country in the poorest region of the nation, the Mississippi Delta. I lived mostly on the Arkansas side in a small community called Pumpkin Bend. And my family, like most families, in that part of the world sometimes struggled financially, but as a child, I never felt poor. And there are many reasons for this, but the most relevant reason for the purposes of this talk, why I never felt poor as a child, is that my father shared with me and encouraged in me endless delight in language. We are both uh, my father and I were drunk. And he just has a decidedly Wallace Stevens-like preference for colorful, funny language. I remember when I was a small child, he would tuck me in at night, and sometimes he would say, Buddy, I hope you go right to sleep and dream about Santa Claus and gooseberry tarts. I thought, gooseberry tarts? I don't even know what that is. I don't even think Daddy knew what that was. He just had heard this phrase somewhere, and it threw a banquet of color in his imagination, and he liked it. I remember also that my family would sit around and watch Arkansas Razorback sporting events, and there was a basketball player for the Razorbacks with this wonderful name, Sunday Adebayo. And Dad did not care at all about sports. My mother cares a lot about sports. Daddy really doesn't give a flip if the Razorbacks win or lose. But he would sit in the room with us and get out his guitar and start writing a song about Sunday at a bio. And this would drive my mother crazy. <laughs> She's trying to watch the game. But in the Delta, we pronounced the word bayou, bio. And so this name, Sunday at a bio, suggested to Dad the country baptizings uh, that our church would hold 
Sunday at the bio. And so this is what his song was about. Speaking of church, I remember we had this old man who played a flat top box guitar. His name was Othi Allgood, and Dad just loved this name. I think he wanted to be Othi Allgood. And Othi has been dead now for decades. But to this day, Daddy will just walk into a room of our house when the family are gathered and unaccountably blurt out the question, whatever happened to Othi Allgood? (laughs) And uh, the last time I was home, I was working on a poem by myself in a room by myself. And Daddy walked in and said, man, want to make him a poem? You got to throw his medulla oblongata into gear. (laughs) And I knew that the whole point of this is that he loved this the word medulla oblongata. <laughs> I, told, I told Daddy this morning that I was doing this talk. I called him. And I mentioned that I was going to be talking a bit about how much he loves funny sounding words. And I said, could you just sum up for me your strange relationship with language? And he said, oh, Greg, there's a whole bunch of funny words you can have some fun with. And that about sums it up. (laughs) I mean, that's pretty much what I do for a living as a poet. Have fun with funny words. I'm very lucky to have a father who has quickened my imagination with his inventive use of language. And and I've had a lot of friends who've done the same for me. A lot of friends who are wordsmiths. But more than any friend or family member, poetry has made my mind an an interesting place to live. I remember when I was in junior high school, I was reading a lot of poetry, and I was also playing football. And one morning, I happened upon T.S. Eliot's Drop Dead, beautiful poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, a poem that I had never read before. I read it and I was blown away. One of the dominant sensory impressions that I had from this poem was of kind of a cream-colored porcelain, which is a natural thing to take away from this poem. There's, there's a lot of talk of tea time. Uh, this is the poem that includes those lines, should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? It's the poem many of you have heard. It begins, let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. I was thinking about this poem all day, and I had to go to football practice. And I remember that during a lull in practice, I was standing there on the field, And I saw my friend Johnny Green, a teammate, and I could see through the face mask of his helmet that the whites of his eyes were exactly like this polished ecru porcelain that I had been seeing as I read the Eliot poem, and I was staring sort of creepily at him. (laughs) And he caught me and accused me of having a crush on him. I just turned away, (laughs) tried to try to pretend that nothing had happened. I remember during this time of my life lying in bed at night, unable to sleep because I was luxuriating in poems, in words, in language. And I remember very clearly one night thinking, this is just delight. It costs nothing. And nobody can take it away from me. Nobody can take it away from me. So I guess I may as well just come right on out and admit I tricked y'all. The title of my talk is a ruse. I thought maybe I could fool y'all uh, into believing that maybe as a poet I have access to some secret special knowledge that could help you make wise decisions in the difficult times of your life. But the truth is I'm as confused as y'all are and am thoroughly unqualified to give advice, but when I say that poetry can help you make up your mind, what I really mean is this. When you fall in love with poems, poetry becomes one of the most important things that your mind is made up of. Poetry 
can help you create and beautify the spiritual space in which you live. If your mind is a gallery, poetry hangs beautiful, wondrous pictures on the wall. If your life is, in some sense, a conversation, poetry makes that conversation so much livelier, so much more interesting. I hope that not of one of you ever falls on hard times, but if you do, and you have to lie down alone like an old soldier in his scuffed boots, you have a mind full of the wildness and beauty and freedom of poems. That way, even if there's not a penny in your pocket or a friend nearby, you'll have a gracious plenty to look forward to. You can catch those tigers in red weather. Thank y'all. This poem is one of my first uh, poetry videos. It was called, Who Wants to Live Forever? It examines our ideas of immortality and, and mortality. It sort of resulted from some of my studying of the work of uh, some scientists who, who uh, call themselves uh, terror management theorists, uh, founded on the work of Ernest Becker, who wrote a great deal about the strategies that we use individual strategies and societal strategies to cope with the idea of the finality of death. Who wants to live forever? Not I, said Stephen Hawking, his electronically generated voice betraying only the slightest crack of sadness. Or was it a failing voice chip? He soon spiraled out of sight, head over wheels, spinning over and into the event horizon of one of his favorite black holes. Can he hope to come rebooting out of the other side in another dimension, the renewed body, his mind intact? If only Carl Sagan were here to explain it to us. Who wants to live forever? Not the evangelist, or so he says. He knows Jesus personally, and knows that after he expires, he is promised a ringside seat to view the dispatching of the damned. Even so, he occasionally sheds a tear over all his shiny cougarans and his lovely private secretary, but he could never hope to baggage to that far cloud. There he will while away his immortal days in white polyester robes and cotton candy wings, Harp handing into eternity the badly rendered old-time gospel songs he so loved as a child. Who wants to live forever? Not the shaman in his hut, or the mystic in her cave. Not fully in this world in the first place, their eyes are on the burning copal and the soft sandalwood incense that is rising, always rising, evaporating into the morning light. They know the battle of meals versus metaphysics is always pitched until death ends the illusion. Who wants to live forever? Not Private Billy Frank on his last day in Afghanistan riding to the field hospital. His charred leg is a mile away and receding, still smoldering next to Sergeant Wilbur's burnt body in the smoking coffin that once was their APC. Right now, he would gladly surrender his soul for an eternity of soft blackness without pain. Soon, the morphine will deliver him. Who wants to live forever? Not the suicide. Not the terrorist. Not the daredevil. Not the matador. Not the destroyed lover. Not the junkie. Not the man on the rack. Who then wants to live? That frightened man lying there in the fitful bed and the fevered sheets by the open window. He is not interested in forever. He is only hungry for a few more days, a few more hours, a few more minutes, a few more.
This satiric poem I wrote about suburban life for the most part. Uh, I've spent a fair amount of my life living in suburbs of one kind or another. Uh, it also deals with uh, some rather satirical looks at uh, society and how society uh, manages itself. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's called Halcyon Days and I hope you enjoy it. In my hometown, stores are pharmacies. My windows are funhouse mirrors. Above each door, the drug of choice blares out in neon exclamation. Oxycontin, Ritalin, Viagra. In my hometown, the train runs twice a day. Precisely at 6 a.m., it drops off bundles of headlines and ads. And at 8 p.m., it picks up garbage bags of fish heads and regrets. My hometown football stadium is now a drive-in movie. Every Friday night, the scoreboard displays the number of infidelities accomplished by us and the folks down yonder. On giant screens behind the goalposts, moving images of doe-eyed ladies repeat the numbers dutifully displayed. Home 432, visitors 365. I would get the hell out, but my sin-stuffed bags are over the limit and will never clear customs. Besides, tomorrow I may run for mayor. This is a surreal poem, kind of uh, Joycean, I think you would say, like Finnegan's Wake or something, that uses a lot of wordplay, a lot of strange, incongruous uh, paths of language, incongruous paths that language can take based on cadences, rhythms, sounds, things like that. Anyway, it's dedicated to uh, a mad French poet. Uh, I call it Mickey the Momo. I enjoy doing these poetry videos because it incorporates the spoken word with my interest in audiovisual uh, presentations, which uh, I think adds a whole lot to the to the poem. Mickey Rourke's face, ruined like the map of some bombed and busted kill country, spoke at me across a rough picnic table whose hobnailed boards ruination rivaled his stubble-spiked, unshaven face. His words, sobbed and blurred into his cups, were drowned out by a crowd of surly, zoot-suited pachucos looking for muerte for the next best thing, eh? Proud in their bubonic illiteracy and smooth as their black mustachios, they slithered in next to Mickey the Momo, forcing the mezcal bottle from his boxing glove. I became fierce to show them the explosive powder of language by way of my best Groucho Marx imitation. Their hapless linghams hung at a 45 degree longitude, luggaged with a tearful nostalgia for the Highland home. Their suddenly downcast eyes rolled into the pools of Mickey's spilled drink and drank. They had no taste for truncated prose or for the legions of words whose wagons were now dragging boats and buildings out onto the beach where Salvador Dali sat munching an erotic Eucharist while waiting for Gala's ship to come in. I yelled into the beers of my zoot-suited interlocutors, fretting that they might slipper a knife beneath my ribs. But my words came out as smeared and blurred as a slumbering syllabus, crashing with no survivors. <laughs> 